the response of prayer, uh, God wants us to respond to certain things with prayer. And so uh, we'll look at a passage. And the first time I've ever preached on this passage is today. In 37 years of ministry, I've never preached on this one. How about that? So here you go. This is the inaugural trial run at this. Um, Jesus is concerned that the disciples may lose heart when they are confronted with hostility, with suffering that could weigh them down. And so he tells this parable. It is not the easiest parable. So here we go. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth. So the followers of Jesus will encounter injustice. All people encounter injustice. Would you agree? Everybody does at some point along the way. Injustice is when things aren't right and the powerful hurt the powerless. And Jesus is concerned about his disciples. They have had the immense privilege of being with God in flesh. Jesus embodies the kingdom of God. What God wants totally happens in Jesus. So Jesus heals people that no one else can heal. He casts out evil. He speaks the truth. Even when it's complicated and people don't understand and they vie for various places in the status of things. Jesus speaks the truth. He educates people about who God really is and what God really cares about. And so just being around Jesus is so fulfilling 
His love brings such joy that they, the disciples, think the world's just going to get all better. It's all better. It's all good. And soon, everything will be right. They expect, Jesus says he'll come back, they'll expect all things to be made right. And we know that we've been waiting a couple of thousand years for all things to be right. And they're not. It's not all right, is it? There's a lot wrong in the world. There's a lot of suffering. So the disciples will be tempted to lose heart. Now, when it says lose heart, what, what it means here is that they'll be tempted to be discouraged and say things like, what's the use? It's not going to make any difference anyway. The bad will keep on being bad. Wrong things will keep on happening. What's the use? We've all been there before, haven't we? Where we wonder what's the use? We're tempted as well to lose heart. Suffering can weigh us down. Now, sometimes we get the false notion that because we follow Jesus, because we worship God, that somehow our quota of suffering will be reached and then we won't suffer anymore. Well, that's not true, is it? Now, I grew up in a home that was full of alcoholism. And because of that, there were lots of, what shall I say, disappointments. There were things that went wrong. There were things that were said that shouldn't have been said, things done that shouldn't have been done. And so I became a Christian and followed Jesus, and my mother became a Christian, and my brother became a Christian, and we all got together and prayed for my father, who had the drinking problem, that he would become a Christian. And after 10 years of prayer... He became a Christian, all right? And so then I thought, my quota with the, the bane of alcoholism is over. It's, it's full. I am free. And then my wife and I were driving home from a Sunday school party on a Saturday night. And we were driving in Proctorville in a 1976 Oldsmobile Cutlass. I like that car. It was a two-door, and it had a big engine in it. Big. A lot of hood room out in front of me. And I'm driving along, and there are a number of cars coming our direction, and I'm going to be turning left into our subdivision. And so I'm slowing down to around 30 miles an hour. And out of the line of cars, the last car in the line squeals out of the line and accelerates into my lane and hits us head on. The impact was so hard that the left front wheel of the Oldsmobile Cutlass ended up even with the steering wheel, crushed the car. My wife, uh, it was just the two of us, our little girl, Rebecca, was home, uh, she went into the windshield, had all kinds of jagged glass in her face. 
um, the floorboard of the car um, was lifted up and just got my left leg. And uh, off to the hospital we went, did all kinds of x-rays, sent us home that night. I couldn't walk. And the next morning, though, I was determined to preach. And I put my leg over the side of the bed. And when the blood rushed to it, I thought my leg was going to blow off. And so I got back into bed, and it was the only Sunday I ever missed in 37 years of preaching was after that car accident. We were hit head on by a drunk driver, a drunk driver. Now we're fortunate, we were fortunate to be alive, really. If we'd been driving a smaller car, look out. But that car was like a tank and it uh, helped save us. Mary Lynn would later on have an operation on her neck and they would have to put bone in between two bones because her disc would, would obliterate. And she has had all kinds of problems since then from that. So our lives were changed in a moment. And, and so... I say all this to say, do not think just because you're serving God or you're trying to do what's right or you're worshiping and all that, that you will be exempt from suffering. It just doesn't happen. I'm sorry. I wish it were different. <laughs> But that's the way it is. Things happen to people. And, it's, and if we're not careful, we'll get the idea that because things happen and because God has let them happen, then sometimes we can think, does God really have any power at all? Just letting all this evil stuff happen in the world. How we view God matters with how we pray and how we stay faithful. So Jesus tells this parable to get at this difficulty of how we see God. Will we respond to the injustice in the world with prayer? Will we not lose heart? So here's the parable. And it begins with there is a widow and she is not powerless, which shocks us. Because in that day and time, widows were often considered to be powerless people. Um, women could not inherit land. Only the guys could. That's not fair, is it? Is that an injustice? It certainly is. So if you died and you didn't have any sons or your husband died and you didn't have any sons and you're left at a widow, you, your property was up for grabs. So we don't know the exact situation, but this widow acts contrary to what every, everybody expects. She goes to the magistrate. She goes to the judge and demands justice against her opponent someone who's presumably trying to take property and this judge doesn't want to listen 
but it doesn't matter. She keeps going back. In fact, she's rather aggressive. It says here, um, the unjust judge will say in the parable that um, this woman is bothering him and he doesn't want her to wear him out. Now, in the Greek, the phrase wear him out should, if we translated it literally, it would be he doesn't want her to hit him under the eye. All right? In other words, he doesn't want a black eye <laughs> from the woman. <laughs> All right? This woman's aggressive enough that he fears she might hit him, which would cause you to lose face in that society. <laughs> So this woman is unusual. She's aggressive and wants her justice. She demands it. So she doesn't act powerless. All right? So we'll come back to that. Then there is this unjust judge. This is not a nice judge. This is not a fair judge. This is not one who's concerned with the truth. This judge is <laughs> unjust, all right? Unjust. It says, he, and yet, he will relent because of the woman's pressure and grant her justice. He will end up doing the right thing. But this unjust judge, it says of him, he doesn't fear God. And all through the scriptures, it says we're to fear God. And by fear, you know it means to have respect, to value, to be in awe of God. Okay? That's really what it means, to worship God, to have fear of God. It's not merely to be afraid that God's going to get you or something like that. It's rather to be honoring of God, okay? So this guy doesn't fear God. He doesn't care anything about God. Plus, it says he doesn't respect people. So he doesn't respect God, and he doesn't respect people. This is not a very nice guy. Now, you remember somebody came to Jesus once and asked, what is, what, are, what is the greatest commandment? And you remember what he said? Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay? So love God with everything you are. That's the greatest commandment. And then he said a second is like it. And what did he say? Love your Neighbor as yourself. All right. So, if we're going to do right in the world, we want to love God, respect God, and respect our neighbor. Love our neighbor. This guy could care less about either. He doesn't love God, and he doesn't love people. So, he doesn't care about the widow. Now, finally, because of her pressure, he decides he's just got to get rid of her. And so he gives her justice. He doesn't give it to her because it's the right thing to do. He just gives it to her because she annoys him. And he wants away from her, all right? That's not really the right motivation for a judge, is it? <laughs> okay. But here's the thing. What does Jesus say? Well, he helps us out. 
And the first thing he says is, listen to the unjust judge. Will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? So here's the point. God is not an unjust judge. God wants justice just as all of us do. God wants wars to cease. God wants the powerful to treat the powerless with love and respect and to share power and lift them up. God wants us to get along. God doesn't want anybody to be sick. God doesn't want there to be accidents. God doesn't want people to do wrong things. All right? God is not like the unjust judge. But sometimes we think things are so bad in the world that we just got to keep asking God, keep after God, beg God, and finally God will relent and get involved. Finally, God will do something. It may be too late, but that's how we think sometimes. And there's nothing further from the truth. Now, the thing that trips up so many people with God is this question. Why does God allow evil things to happen to what? Good people. Why is there suffering in the world? Why is there evil in the world? Why does God allow that? It's a big question, isn't it? It's a big question because we know life's not fair. And if we're not careful, we can get so immersed in all of that that we lose heart. We lose heart. Well, here's the deal. think it's the price of love. In order for God to make everything just right, God would have to go around us. And God loves us. And the price of love is what? Involvement with us. So yes, God cares about justice in the world. And God wants us to help bring the justice, to get involved with God. So it happens. And that's a difficulty because we are mighty slow. We're slower than God. <laughs> so when it asks the question here, Will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. What that's saying is God's character is such that when we cry out for justice, God acts quickly. But we don't. We're slow. And it's the price of love. So, here's the point. Whenever we feel powerless in this evil age, Remember the widow. We are not as powerless as we think because we are connected to a God who cares about justice. We are. We're not as powerless as we think. We can always do something the powerless widow wasn't powerless, was she? 
She went and kept on. She did not give up. Years ago, um, there was these writings about Greek um, leaders, and there's um, a vignette about the father of Alexander the Great. And a woman comes to Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great, and she begs for her case to be heard uh, concerning justice. And Philip says to her, I don't have time for you. I'm the king. And she says, if you don't have time for me, then give up being king. I like that. I like that. In other words, I'm not going to lose my dignity here. I have something. I have power. It may look like I don't have any power in the face of a king, but I do. I'm a child of God, and I can ask and speak and want. So, whenever we're faced with injustice, what do we do? We begin with the response of prayer. We pray. We ask God for what is right. Now, Jesus doesn't tell us how to pray, what to exactly to pray for. He doesn't give us all the details. But what Jesus is saying, if order not to lose heart, whenever we face suffering, whenever we face injustice, wrong in the world, we pray. And by the Spirit, prayer will then lead us to get involved in God's move towards justice. We may not, can't get uh, involved in all things. There, the world's too big, right? But by the Spirit, we can get involved somewhere because God will lead us. Jesus closes by saying, when the Son of Man comes, when Jesus returns in all his glory and then makes everything right, he asks, will I find faith on the earth? Will I find people who still believe that love overcomes? That love is worth it. Will I still find faith? People who trust that God is working for our best quickly. I think so. I think so. The good news we will not lose heart. God is with us. Let's pray. God, we're all facing something. We're all facing some kind of suffering. And sometimes the, the most difficult pain to bear is our own. And so help us, God, to pray not to lose heart, but to know you're working through us to make things right, to make things according to what you want. This is our trust. Amen.